Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Melanie Blake, and I'm the Director of Classical Pursuits. And I'm here today also with Samantha Clark, Marketing Manager at our travel partner, Worldwide Quest. Um, and Samantha will be coming on later in the at the end of the webinar to manage the Q&A session that we'll have at the end. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Our last webinar of 2020, believe it or not. Um, I think we're all we'll all be glad to see the end of 2020. Um, we so you may you may have noticed when you registered for this webinar that it is a part of a series. So in the new year, we'll be returning with the rest of the series, which will focus more on Quebecois literature of the 20th and 21st centuries. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about an earlier period and I'll go over that in just one second. Um, before I start the webinar proper, I think that many of you are familiar with our, our platform by now, but just a quick reminder, the two main settings that are useful for you are the sound, which uh, you'll either see the word audio or perhaps see a an icon of a microphone or or an earpiece on your on your device. You can open those settings and adjust the sound as you see fit. And as I mentioned, we will be having a Q and A session at the end of the webinar. You'll see a either a the word questions on your interface or a question mark symbol, and you can click on that open it to ask any questions. Uh, you can also use the questions field if you have any technical problems. Samantha will be here throughout the webinar helping, um, helping you with any issues that you might have. And we are recording this webinar, so if you have to leave early or you want to watch it again, we will be sending it to everyone uh, later on, uh, maybe perhaps later on today or by the end of the week. Um, so again, I'm Melanie Blake, Director of Classical Pursuits, and I'll be talking today about writing a fragmented nation, early Quebecois literature. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the with this picture that I've chosen for uh, for the start of the webinar. It is of the St. Lawrence River, um, quite a bit north of Quebec City. And I love this picture both for the way that it it embodies the the beauty of Quebec province as a especially as a province full of of water not not just of the St. Lawrence River but of many other rivers and lakes and um it just the uh, it just makes you want to be on the St. Lawrence right now and the way that uh, the the sky is reflected off the water kind of symbolizes the the way that the many different people and languages that are present, that were and are present in Quebec, uh, reflect off each other in the literature of, of this province. Um, but also, you see, you know, there's there's a little bit of fragmentation. There's the um, the wind is is uh, making the water look a little fragmented. And you have the clouds, too, that are putting some texture and different color in the sky. Um, because from the beginning, of course, there have been many different peoples and languages present in what's now Quebec. And I'm going to talk uh, about all of that both today and in the series to come. So we're going to sadly move away from the beautiful St. Lawrence River, um, but get started in uh, the webinar proper. So just a quick reminder, especially for those who might not be from Canada, this is a, a map of um, the current province of Quebec. It was and it's easy to forget, right, how big it is, how far north it goes, um, all the way up to the Labrador Sea. And um, of course, you have down in the south, you have the big cities that we are familiar with. You have Montreal, the capital, and farther, or sorry, not the capital, Montreal, and then farther up north, um, Quebec City. And I'll be focusing mostly on Quebec City today, but not exclusively. Uh, and the, the image is taken from, oops, sorry, my cursor seems, or there we go. The image that I showed you was taken from around here. So a little bit north of Quebec City. Um, so again, just a little bit ref of a refresher on where um, where Quebec is and, and how large it is. And 
as I mentioned, it goes it goes right all the way up to the Labrador Sea. When um, there was a French presence that started to be established in Quebec in 1534, 1535, there were, of course, already indigenous or First Nations people there. And they were in um, what scholars and linguists divide into three main groups based on language families, the Algonquians, the Iroquoians, and the Inuit. Um, and again, these are organized by language family. I've listed some of the different tribes or groups that fell within these families. These are, this is no means a comprehensive list, um, but just a few of the different um, First Nations tribes and groups that were in, that were in Quebec. Um, and they lived in, in different parts, of course. Um, the Inuit were, were all the way up north. Um, by the Labrador Sea, and the other groups uh, were spread out across different parts of the province. And of course, they had their own different lifestyles, um, crafts, arts, and cultures. Mostly, mostly oral cultures in terms of of literature, right? It's, uh, legends, creation myths, or other myths, songs, and stories. It's mostly an oral culture. Um, on the right here, this is a 19th century woodcut of the figure Glooskap, who figures, um, he's an important character in a lot of literature from the Mi'kmaq tribe, but also other tribes. He appears in, in different forms in various tribes with different spellings of his name, um, but some form of this name Glooskap. And he's a kind of trickster figure. He often takes down people who are uh, self-important or self-serving. So he's seen as a kind of a, a figure for, for good in that sense. Um, he, and he appears in a lot of different type of, types of myths, including the Mi'kmaq uh, creation myth. So you have, you have, I'm sorry, you, and it, I don't, it's hard to know exactly how many Native American, or sorry, um, First Nations peoples were present in, in Quebec. A couple different sources say a few thousand, um, which seems small to me, um, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that field at all. So if anybody has some more information, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, but they, you know, so these First Nations are there and um, the French arrive, arrive in 1534, 1535, notably Jacques Cartier. And you see an image of here, him on the right, um, this is, this was not painted during his lifetime. There are no existing images of him that were painted um, in his lifetime. But he did, he took various voyages on behalf of the French crown uh, to, to what is now Canada. Um, on his, kind of one of his more famous trips, the second voyage, he explored the St. Lawrence River, River Valley in 1535. And then the first French settlement was at Port Royal in 1605, and that's what's now Nova Scotia. I'll show that in just a moment. And um, there was slow, slow growth at first. I think 50 years after the um, after Cartier arrived, there were still only about 3,500 colonists um, in what was then New France. Um, but by the time of the Treaty of Paris in 1763, there were about 60,000. And I'll talk more about the Treaty of Paris in a little bit. So here's a map showing his second voyage of 1535-1536. Um, he comes through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, what's now Quebec City, Tadacona, and what's now Montreal, Jalaga. And just a little bit more up than here, sorry, so let me just move my, uh, ah, let me just move my interface here, which is getting in my way. There we go. Um, here you have this Port Royal settlement, and I'm going to come back to this map in just one second. But I just wanted to show you. Here's a, it's a, this is a recreation, of course, a recreation of that first settlement at Port Royal. And you can see, so here again is the Gulf of St. Lawrence um, where Cartier came in. And you can see on this map, this is 
um, you know, the area that is na that North America, what's now Canada and the U.S., of course, there was a lot of changing of hands because both uh, France, Spain, and England were all interested in this territory. Um, so what was New France included on what's now several of the eastern provinces of Canada and Ontario as well, um, for, um, and, and the region of Acadia, which you see up, up here. Okay, that was all part of New France. And um, France lost some of that territory in 1713. As you see this purple part here, they lost that, including parts of the, including Port Royal, where the first settlement was, what's now Newfoundland. Um, and then later on in 1763, um, they lost the vast majority of this territory that, that in the east here that they held. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Here you can see that in more detail. So after 1763, Britain had all of this to the Mississippi River. And one, one thing that I think it's in, important to keep in mind when discussing the literature of early Quebec. Um, as I mentioned, by 1763, which marked the end of the Seven Years' War, or what is what was called in the U.S. the French and Indian War, um, where France really has to give up most of its territory in Canada and in what's now Canada and the U.S. By this time, by 1763, there are about 60,000 colonists, but they spoke a range of dialects. They definitely did not all speak French. And this reflected the fact that France, uh, or that French was not standardized at this time. Um, so you had these um, immigrants coming over, or immigrants or colonists to from France to the New World, but speaking a lot of different languages. Most of the colonists who were in New France came from the north and the west of France. Sorry, my mouse is giving me a little trouble here. There we go. Um, which makes sense, right? Because it's um, it's a little bit easier to access the Atlantic Ocean. So they're, they're coming from the north and the west. Uh, Cartier himself was from Brittany. And they're speaking all of these different languages. France has had kind of two main groups, um, the Languedoc in the north and the Languedoc in the south, or Occitan, and then some other languages that that ha had less in common um, with the Languedoc and the Languedoc, such as Breton or Alsacien. So the so the people who are coming to New France are speaking Normand or Picard or Gallo or Angevin. And um, the they, are, they they very much look to France for their literature, and the all this literature coming from France um, played a role in helping to unify these different colonists who spoke different languages. Um, and of course, the like later tensions with the French crown, and then later on after 1763 in particular, when all of these colonists came under the British crown, um, tensions with the British and the British Empire, um, these also served as unifying factors for people who, you know, came from from different parts of France and didn't necessarily have a lot in common. So, what did these people who uh, were these 60,000 people who were in New France, what did they read and write? I think it's a lot of what you would find in in this period, regardless of whether you were looking at South America or North America. Um, they were interested in diaries and accounts of exploration, of course, in travelers' narratives. Um, there were, you know, the bureaucracy of, of managing this was, was enormous. So there's many, many official reports and correspondence. Um, Missionary work was a was a key part, of course, of of expansion into the New World. Both, you know, both we know this in the 
um, the Spanish in the New World and the French and maybe less, a little less so the English, but missionary work and proselytizing was a, was a key part of what they were trying to do and histories of the colony. Those were, these would be the main forms of literature that people were reading and writing. So not so much fiction or verse or poetry at this point of, of course, these things do exist, but what is coming out of the colonies is, is mostly, I guess what you would loosely group it as, as nonfiction. Um, and of course, folk tales, songs, and legends. Um, mo uh, uh, there was a very rich oral culture of literature. And when I say, what do people write? Um, you know, there were, there were people writing in the colonies about their experience, um, but everything was published in France and um, until quite late. And so they're getting all of their books and um, written materials from France. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So who, or, and we're gonna get to a little who were, was reading and writing. Um, here you have an account of, uh, written by Cartier of, of his uh, second voyage there. Um, and he's, he's saying here that he's, claiming New France on behalf of the King um, Francois Premier, Francois the First. Um, this is the first two pages of his account of his voyage, um, which was later uh, you know, printed and published for, for a larger distribution. This is the account that he wrote. And you also had um, one of the most famous histories of New France was this one appearing in 1609 by Marc Les uh, Lescarbeau, and you can see here is printed in Paris. And he is, uh, like, like a lot of these uh, 17th century uh, publications, you, you get a lot of information about what you're gonna read uh, right on the first page. So he's gonna talk about navigations, discoveries, the people who live um, in this area, both colonists and um, what were called West, Indian, West Indians. Um, and the, the diverse fortunes of these people and what they did and how they did it. Um, so a very, very detailed, uh, you know, these histories were very detailed and full of both practical uh, kind of, and what we would, what we might be called anthrop anthropological descriptions, descriptions, physical descriptions, geographic um, descriptions. They were, so they were very valuable sources of information for both colonists themselves and for people in France about, about what was happening in this new world. Marc Lescarbo, this same person, also did write a play, the first one that was performed in New France. Um, it was called Le Théâtre de Neptune, and um, the, Nep the Neptune Theater in Nova Scotia today takes its name from this theater. Sorry for the grainy picture there. That was the best one I could find. Um, but this play was performed in uh, 1606, I believe, and it was performed in the harbor. Um, and it was a kind of pageant, a kind of reception pageant where uh, Neptune came in and was greeted by different First Nations people who accepted uh, accepted French rule and the French representatives as uh, their new rulers in, in a very kind of ceremonial and agreeable way. Um, so that's why I put this little cartoon up on the right-hand side. Uh, this is from, this was a, a recreation, a reproduction of that play um, at the Montreal Infringement Festival in 2006, that was um, kind of giving, giving a challenging this view that the the French came in and and the First Nations people were like, oh yes, thank you so much for coming and doing all the marvelous things that you're going to do, um, because I think we all know that that um, that's really not how it happened. So I just wanted to, but this, the, so, but the, the cartoon takes a woodcut from the period and you can see it, it kind of modifies a little bit, but you can see that the play is actually being performed in the harbor. And that, that is what, ha that was what happened. 
Another person that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, Marie de l'Incarnation, um, born Marie Guillon in Tours in uh, 1599. She was born to a family of master bakers. And from a young age, she was very pious. Um, she would read a lot and pray and meditate more than she liked playing with other children. And she felt herself destined for a religious life. Um, but her parents wanted her to get married. So she did. Um, she married um, someone named Martin, who was a, a master silk worker. And they had a son, Claude. But her husband died only a couple of years after they got married. Um, the family business had already been struggling. Marie took it over for some time, but ultimately decided to liquidate it and enter um, enter the religious life in France. Um, so when her son was 11, she separated from him and entered uh, a cloistered religious life. And when, as she continued, you know, she would read and meditate and pray. She felt really called. She had visions where she was called to, she said, go to, to New France and continue her work there. So she did. Um, she arrived in Quebec City in um, about 1530, or sorry, 1639. And she was the founder of one of the best known uh, orders of nuns there, the Ursulines. And here, you have a, an image from, in Quebec City from the Ursuline convent. Um, there's part of what was the school and a chapel. And now it, there's, it's, um, it's, uh, there's a museum there. It's a really lovely place and one of the places that we'll visit on our Quebec City trip, which I'll talk more about uh, at the end. And she, um, um, she, she, was involved in that convent er, it, with the Ursulines and as the founder of the Ursulines until her death. And I, as I mentioned, she gave up her son when he was 11 and she, she wrote extensively to her son throughout her life, many, many letters. And I just wanted to read part of one of these to you, translated by Mary Dunn in a recent book. She writes to her son, are you not glad my very dear son that I abandoned to his holy direction in you, leaving you out of love for him. Have you not found a boon therein which cannot be expressed? Know then, once more, that when I separated myself from you, I died while still alive, and that the Spirit of God, who was unmoved by the tender feelings I had for you, gave me no rest until I delivered the blow. This divine Spirit who saw my struggles had no sympathy for my feelings saying to me in the depths of my heart, quickly, quickly, it is time, delay no longer. There is no longer anything good left for you in the world. Then he opened the door to, opened the door to religion for me. You came with me, and in leaving you, it seemed to me that my soul was being sundered from my body with extreme pains. Um, and this is just one, one tiny glimpse into this complex relationship she had with the son that she left. He um, he became a mystic himself. Um, his name he, he had his father's last name Claude Martin, um, and he, you know, he was initially extremely angry with her for for oops, sorry for leaving him. But it seems that they they had some kind of reconciliation. And her letters are very fascinating. Um, like I said, they've been recently published. Um, translated and published, and I'll have more information about that at the end. But she's just one example of of the type of, of writing that was present, you know, her, both her spiritual meditations and, and a huge volume of letters that she that she wrote. And this is just a, an image of um, another convent, the Augustines, and I put this one up because um, this is where we're going to be staying on our on our Quebec City trip in September. 2021. And um, these images just made me so happy to think about going to Quebec City, staying in this beautiful um, restored and converted convent. You can see the kind of the one of the main part of the convent here with the rest of Quebec City in the background. And then just a little example of 
um, of one of the rooms. And uh, it just got me really excited for the architecture and history that we're going to experience in Quebec City. And that's the Monastère des Augustines, the, the Augustinians. All right, so moving away from religious writing um, to newspapers. So as I, I had mentioned before, people were getting all of their, their written materials from France until 1764. Um, well, let me, let me clarify that a little bit. So um, there, there was an earlier newspaper set up um, in Nova Scotia in the 1750s. And that newspaper is thought to be the first newspaper printed in in what's now Canada, and um, scholars say even in, in North America, um, one of the first in North America. Um, in Quebec, the first press in, in um, the first press was set up in 1764 um, by two printers from Philadelphia, which of course had a very strong um, printing culture, and. After, um, after the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years' War um, and established British control over um, what was New France, as I mentioned, af after that, you had, you had a lot of movement back and forth um, from people from um, what was the British colonies to the, to the former French colonies and vice versa, depending on their different loyalties. Because throughout all this, there was a complex system of allies allyships and loyalties um, among the different First Nations tribes, among the French colonists and the British colonists. Um, anyway, so in 1764, William Brown and Thomas Gilmore set up um, Quebec City's first newspaper and the first press, first printing press in Quebec, and the Quebec Gazette. And you can, I'm gonna show a little bit of, of a close up in uh, in just one second, you can kind of see one of the front pages there. These gazettes were usually weekly, maybe two pages to four pages at first, um, and later, of course, became longer, longer and more frequent publications. And here you can see um, a, another first page of this Quebec Gazette. Both of them are from 1764, and you can see here this one's from June 21st. Um, jeudi, 21 juin, and I wanted I wanted to share this a little bit with you because it it shows you the, um, the what kind wh what kind of newspaper people were trying to publish. Um, it was really important to have to have accurate information about what was going on for people because you know there there is a lot of government turmoil throughout this time. Um, in terms of how how the different colonists are going to be represented, and what information they're getting from um, from the crown, and they wanted to know what was happening in other parts of these colonies. And so we see here a a kind of um, a kind of approach that we would think of as quite modern when they when uh, the the uh, publishers write with regard to the material occurrences of the American colonies and West Indian islands. We may venture to affirm that from the extensive correspondence published for this purpose in each of them, many interesting truths will be laid before the public with all becoming impartiality and candor. So the language and the, the structure, right, we might find a little ornate or old fashioned sounding, but the, um, the main idea I think is, is one that we hold, uh, to be very important um, in journalism today, and um, that is maybe <laughs> has always is elusive. Is it more elusive today than it was then? I I don't know. Um, but this interest in truth laid before the public in a way that's impartial and frank, and um, they want to know important things are happening, and they want to know the colonists want to know what these are. Just a, a little example of some early journalism coming out of Quebec. And uh, so that was 1764. It's still quite some decades until you start to see um, literary works coming out of Quebec itself. Um, this is the first book of, of literary, the first literary work published in Quebec. Um, it was epistles and satires songs and other other types of verse by Michel Bibot. 
And you can see here it was um, printed in Montreal in 1830. Um, this the, on the right, the unicorn is just a woodcut from from that book. So you know, after the Seven Years' War ending in 1763, um, you know, you you again have a lot of turmoil, and there's not a huge amount of literary production. There is some, and I just you know, I'm, I only have a limited time today, so I'm just giving you an overview. Um, but it really wasn't until several decades later that literature starts to be published in Canada. And you, so you had verse, and then you, a little later on, you had novels. Um, I'm just blanking out on the date for this. I want to say 1837, a name that um, those of you who are Canadian, you might recognize, Philippe Aubert de Gaspé. Um, this is his first novel on the right, L'Influence d'un Livre. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in one second. So that was the first novel published in Canada uh, in 1837. And on the on the left here, you have um, a restaurant called Aux Anciens Canadiens, the Canadians of old. Um, and it is in a house that was briefly owned by Gaspé. Uh, he didn't live there and he didn't own it for very long, um, but he did own it for some time. And so the restaurant the restaurant itself is called Aux Anciens Canadiens um, after his novel. And that is one of the places that we will be eating on the September 21 trip, September 2021 trip to Montreal, or sorry, to Quebec City. I don't know why I said Montreal, to Quebec City. So I wanted to throw that in there because if you haven't been to um, old Quebec, um, you know, there, there's a lot of it is still preserved and it's a very, very charming and picturesque place. And this restaurant serves tr traditional Quebecois dishes. So let me just show you a little bit of l'influence d'un livre or the influence of a book, just to give you a sense of what Gaspé was doing. Um, there's going to be a lot of text. Don't panic. I'm not going to read all of it. Yeah. So don't panic. <laughs> We're, I'm just I'm just going to briefly summarize the first uh, the first paragraph here. But I just wanted to um, and talk a little bit about what kinds of things Gaspé was doing. So, if, you know, of course, um, people are influenced by the type of literature that's coming from from Paris um, and other parts of France, and they're influenced, of course, as well by what's coming out of England. And you have different movements going on. You have naturalism. You have romanticism. Um, and these um, these movements influence Canadian writing. So the the this novel, oops, sorry, L'influence d'un livre, the influence of a book, is about this main character. Let me just find his name here, Charles Amon, um, and the, an influence that this book, um, Les Ouvrages d'Albert le Petit, the works of Albert of, of little Albert or Albert the Small, the the influence that this book has over him. But I just wanted to share a little bit about this first paragraph. Um, where he's describing that he's setting the scene in a way that I think you would recognize as familiar from uh, other French novels and um, and and British novels of the period. Um, and this is just my own um, uh, quick translation. Um, so he says, on the on the south bank of the St. Lawrence River, in a plain that stretched out just into a chain of mountains whose name we don't know, but where there was a little thatched cottage that didn't, there was nothing remarkable about, about it in itself. Situated at the bottom of a hill, it's, view, it, it's hidden from travelers who came along by a little, um, a little cluster of, of uh, pine trees that protected it against the north wind. And he says, at one point, this miserable little cabin had been Live, was inhabited by three people: a man, his his wife, um, une jeune femme vieille, which vieille, which was would translate as a young woman made old by grief, and a child, fruit of their union. So, like like you see in a lot of novels of this period, he's he's um, he's really setting setting the scene. Um, in some ways, this reminded me of um, some of the descriptions of. Um, Stendhal. Right now we're doing a seminar on the red and the black. And um, Stendhal kind of does the same thing when he's 
taking you to a new place. This has also been translated into English as well. So if you have any, if you want to read it and you have any questions, um, please let me know. Um, so kind of, you know, this um, picture, we might also talk about picturesque novels, um, novels of the countryside, um, novels that either glorified or criticized country life. You know, um, these are the types of, of, of novels that are being written. I just wanted to pause and just put a few dates here to put to put some of this in context. So 1837 is the publication of, of the influence of a book by um, that by Gaspé that I just showed you. Um, there's also um, kind of in the larger world and the political world, there's rebellions um, in in both what's now Ontario and what's now Quebec against British rule. And a very important act that that I think all of you who are Canadian will know about um, the Act of Union passed in the British Parliament when what was uh, Upper Canada, Ontario, and Lower Canada become the province of Canada. So, um, and again, this is what was what is now Ontario and what's now Quebec, roughly um, become one province. Um, I'm not an expert in Canadian history, and I know, but I know this has a lot of important implications that I'll touch on just a little bit. Um, in 1852, Laval University is founded in Quebec City, and that is an important catalyst for the growth of a literary movement in Quebec. Right, the the presence of a university is always, always a factor in kind of the creation and production and reading and discussion of literature. And then in 1859, um, the the parliament or the legislative body of this province of Canada had been um, hadn't been fixed in any one place. But in 1859, it it, mo it, it moves permanently um, to Quebec City, along with all of the clerks and public servants. So that's another important factor in the creation of a of a literary culture that's going to be centered around Quebec City. And uh, here I have. Um, just a lithograph of one of uh, one of the battles of these 1837, 1838 rebellions, um, the Battle of Saint Eustache. So just to kind of put a little context and some dates, and we're going to focus especially on the founding of Laval University. Here you have an image from the end of the 19th century. Um, that shows the university, which was originally, like, like so many universities, was originally a monastery. And around, so around that university, um, grow, uh, a, a, a real literary culture that's that's centered on Quebecois literature starts to form. Um, and two of the most important figures in it were Octave Crémazie and Louis Fréchette. I have some, uh, they're, you know, they're roughly contemporaries. And I'm gonna, and they were part of what is called, oops, sorry, you know, um, ah, let me, I'll, sorry, let me, uh, let me finish the slide here. Um, so here, and Octave Crémazie was the uh, owner of a bookstore. So a lot of poets and writers and politicians and others would gather around his bookstore. You can see the building that used to house the bookstore here in Quebec City. And the next image is an image of Louis, uh, the, the birthplace of Louis Fréchette, which is now on the historic register in Canada and I just included this because it was such a festive winter scene and um, it made me it made me want to go to Quebec right now. Um, so again that's the birthplace of Louis Fréchette and both were really instrumental in creating this Quebecois um, literary movement which was called either the Patriotic School of Quebec or the Literary Movement of Quebec. It takes both names and it, it was um, at first glance, it was it, it was characterized by quote unquote traditional values. Um, so there was a growing a growing sense of nationalism as people were 
um, not happy with the with either the relationship between Quebec and Ontario, the type of representation they had, not happy with their their relationship with the British Crown, and and um, in the in the midst of this, a growing sense of nationalism. So nationalism, um, also patriotism, um, political and social conservatism. Um, of course, it's um, Quebec was hem heavily Roman Catholic, and so and this school. Um, was really connected to um, putting forth Roman Catholic beliefs and convictions, and this, of course, is in contrast to the um, to the British Crown, which um, was, was was not Catholic. Uh, that's a you know a longstanding uh, throughout history, a longstanding controversy or a source of tension um, between between um, initially Britain and France, and then later on Britain and Canada. And, and and opposition to what um, some of these writers saw as a France that had had after the revolution had, had was was a godless and materialist place, a place that they did not want to emulate. Um, so you know we 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 see a a real pushback here. Well, no, we you know we speak French, but we don't want to be like France in our literature or in the way we live, um, that was a, a concern of of a lot of, of the uh, some of the members of this um, of this school or this movement. But at the same time, you did have the influence of French Romanticism. So at this time, you have uh, Victor Hugo, you have Lamartine, um, you have Musset. Um, so and many other, these are just a few of the French writers who were active in this middle part of the 19th century. Um, and of course, in painting, you have Delacroix um, and his contemporaries. So um, you do have a, you do have some, the influence of of French Romanticism. Um, and Romanticism is a is a you know it's hard it's hard to pin down sometimes exactly what it is, but you could say that it was characterized by emotional intensity and lyricism, um, especially for the Quebecois school, themes of fatality and heroism were very important. So you see that in a lot of the works coming out of Canada at this time. Um, violence and exoticism, right? You see both in, in Canada and in France, um, uh, themes of exoticism, whether that's toward the Middle East, or toward First Nations people or other um, other non-European cultures, and in France you also had this idea of a century, a century that is sick, that has that is fundamentally ill in some way, and you know the the patriotic school picked up on that, um, and they, I think somebody like. Hugo would have a very different view of it from somebody like Cremazi, but and they would interpret it in different ways. Um, I don't know if if a lot of the French of all the French romantics would would say that it was in in having the revolution, France had to its detriment become godless. But that's that was the view of many of the people in the Patriotic School of Quebec. So, uh, you know, and, th and this is a very complicated topic. I just wanted to give a little overview of it. But you do have, in, as in so many literary movements, you have a lot of tension or some tension between um, these different influences and everybody has different goals and agendas. One person whose agenda um, is very well known because he was very prolific is Henri Raymond Cazgrin, um, a contemporary of Cremazi and um, Fréchette. And he was he was a, a, a major spokesperson for this um, uh, for this patriotic school of Quebec. He uh, was a cleric and a historian, and he actually spent a lot of time in France because of ill health, uh, doing research and things. But he um, he brought back you know from the National Archives and other places in France, he brought back a lot of or or, or wrote about a lot of materials. Um, that talked about Canada and New France. So a lot of his work was very important in um, in capturing the history of what was New France and then Canada, and very valuable in that way. 
And he also wrote, so he wrote a lot of nonfiction. He wrote a book about Marie de l'Incarnation, the Ursuline founder that I talked about a little earlier. And he also wrote a lot of memoirs. Um, one, one was his souvenance. And he wrote in of his souvenance that um, his goal in, in publishing these memoirs was to show the side of our literature that is perhaps the least studied and yet is the most original in the eyes of foreigners. So he's very aware that a distinctive literature, body of literature um, is being, over time is being cre created in Canada and specifically Quebec. And he wants, and he's aware that other people from other countries are, are interested in this too. And he wants to show them what it's all about. You might be wondering where are all the ladies? <laughs> because as usual, they are outnumbered. Um, but there was, uh, and there are some, um, I don't have time to talk about all of them here, but I did want to talk about one novelist, um, who, her, Marie-Louise Félicité Angers, who wrote under the pen name Laure Conin, and she was, she's lar widely considered to be the first woman novelist in, um, in Quebec, and the first Canadian novelist overall to write uh, a psychological novel or a roman d'analyse. And um, Casgrain actually wrote uh, the introduction to her novel and said, and, and she was really anticipating, you know, um, she's publishing this novel in the later part of the 1800s and really anticipating the psychological novel that would become so important in the 1900s. And um, um, Henri says, oh, well, it's in his introduction, he says, yes, it's only, it's only natural that she would have anticipated this trend because, um, you know, with her, with her natural woman's intuition, she's, she'll know what's coming. And I don't, is that a compliment? I don't know, but that's what he said. Um, and I just wanna share a little extract from this novel, some say it's her her best novel, it's called Angelique de Montbrun. And again, this is just my translation. Um, so this is sort of Angelique who, I won't give away the whole story because it's a very interesting novel and I recommend that you read it. It is available um, in translation as well. Um, and it really is this, this uh, psychological portrait of Angelique. And she says in this one passage, I'd been too sick to not still be weak. And that is perhaps why, and up until that point, the thought of his indifference, his indifference, that's referring to her lover, the thought of his indifference um, had not caused me any particularly violent pain. Without a doubt, that thought didn't leave me. But what I what I experienced usually was rather the feeling of, of a profound dis discouragement of complete misery and the misery that must be felt by an incurably sick man who knows that in uh, gathering all of his forces, he can do nothing more than turn over on his bed of pain. Um, so moving away from kind of adventure novels or picaresque or um, kind of patriotic novels into a, a more nuanced and complicated psychological portrait of a character. And so we are going to end there for today with uh, L'Art Conan uh, at the end of the 19th century, sorry, uh, 18th century. At end of the 19th century. And then next time we're going to move into the 20th century with the Montreal School and lots more to come. Um, the literature of Quebec is is endlessly fascinating. Um, there, there's a lot, especially right now, there's a ton of work being done on it um, in all aspects of it. There's a, I can, um, in the follow-up, I'll give a, the name of a, a scholar at Georgetown University um, who was born in Manitoba, but then uh, came to the United States later and works at Georgetown. Um, she does a lot on 20, 21st century Quebecois writers. Um, the University of Quebec at Montreal um, is doing a lot on indigenous or First Nations writers who are writing in both French and English. And it's a very under 
represented literature, I think, um, in both France and in North America, and perhaps the UK as well, right? But I, I can't speak too much to that. And that's really why I'm so um, excited to continue with the series and tell you more about it, and also for our trip um, in, sept in uh, September 2021. Um, we're really uh, po um, positive and optimistic that we are going to be able to travel in September 2021. And we'll be focusing. We'll be focusing more on literature of the 20th century um, and the 21st century on this trip. But we'll also be exploring this idea of, you know, for now 500 years, all of these different languages coming together, and you know, French, but also French French dialects at first, um, different First Nations languages, people from, you know, many people coming from. Uh, other places to Quebec now who might speak French as a first language or a second language, but they're but they're not from they're not from France. They're from elsewhere. Um, so so many so many influences that are just constantly mixing and changing, and that's something um, as a longtime student of French and the francophone world, um, specifically especially Canada and North Africa. Um, that's something that really interests me. Like how do how do all these influences come together and what what makes something Quebecois literature? It's a difficult question and a contentious question, I think some would say, especially as we're going to see next time with the discussion of um, the separatist movement and a um, the rise of a nationalism that many disagreed with because it, that it was very narrow, restrictive, only one view of what of what it meant to be Quebecois. Um, so there's so much more to discuss. And and then of course, to kind of cap it all off with this trip um, in Quebec City at the beautiful Monastère des Augustines. Um, I'm really excited about it. Fall is gonna be a great time and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be fantastic to get back on the road. Um, so thank you so much for listening, everyone. Please, um, uh, feel free if you have any questions about the trip, um, you can go to classicalpursuits.com. I'll also put the number for um, Donna, our colleague at Worldwide Quest, in, and I'll include that in the follow up. I have further reading for you as well, and I'm ready to take your questions. Let me just get set up here, put my uh, interface back on. Great job, Melanie. Thanks. I encourage anyone, if they have any questions about the trip or the early Quebec literature, type it into the questions tab on your control panel. I have a couple of comments for you already that I wanted to share, Melanie. Yes. Heather wanted you to know that she loved La Grande Fleuve in Tadoussac, and that was the whale watching up in northern Quebec. And then in Quebec City itself, she really enjoyed finding the Maureen Center the old English library. And that happens to be one of the places we're going on our tour. It is absolutely on our tour, yes. Nice, have you been there before? I have not, but I'm hoping I'm hoping to get there um, in the summertime before the trip. Nice, okay. <laughs> Lily, well, Lily and wanted, sorry, go ahead, Sam. Lily wanted you to know, thank you, Melanie, this was wonderful. I wish I could go with you. Nancy said, thank you very much. No questions yet. There we go. Myrna is asking, when does the literature of Quebec distinguish itself from that of Acadie? Uh, Acadie. Um, hmm, that's a, I think that's a question without, without one, one single answer. Um, the because the, the the Acadian so do you want me to go back do you want me to show the map of Acadie again okay let me just um let's go back a bit um, just toward the front uh, I think this was the one oh sorry I just keep I keep moving myself off of the PowerPoint. So here you have Acadia or Acadie. Um, and it was, you know, part, it was 
it encompassed what's now a part of Canada and what's now a part of the US. Um, and the, the British actually referred to the Acadians as the um, neutral French, and they wanted them to, um, to pledge allegiance to the British re regime. Um, so in the, 17, in the 1750s and the early 1760s, they deported, um, I think about, was it about, ten, let me just check here, 10,000, about 10,000 Acadians between 1755 and 1762. So these, these Acadians are up here. And, you know, when we think of um, Acadian, we also think of uh, Louisiana as well sometimes. Um, so the, because a lot of these Acadians were deported out of New France or, or out of this region and down to what's now the United States. So I would say, you know, they, there, they definitely formed new, uh, different type of culture and language than what they had had in, in what's now um, Nova Scotia and other parts of Eastern Canada um, when they were deported to what's now part of the United States. Um, I don't know that there was a huge difference um, before the 1750s in literature that was coming out of Acadia and that was coming out of the rest of New France. Um, there really was this focus on on writing coming out of France, um, and, and that was a, that these histories, these travel biographies. Um, there may have been a different oral culture, but the, um, but that's some, that's some, that's something um, I'm not sure that I could say. I can look it up and point you to some further resources. Interesting. Okay. There's a couple of people mentioning that they are American. They're concerned about travel in Canada. And currently there's the non-essential travel ban. But I mean, this is not until the fall of 2021. So as Melanie said, we're hopeful. We're very hopeful. Things will look a lot different by then. Yeah. And we do have, um, I've posted on the Classical Pursuits website and the Worldwide Quest website has as well um, um, and Sam you you can um, you can probably say more about it as well they worldwide quest has a whole four point plan about um, when it's safe and feasible to travel um, worldwide quest will generally be following the recommendations of um, that are put forth by the Canadian government here in the US of course we have the Department of State that has recommendation tra travel recommendations um, so we are, we are all, you know, we're always, I know, I don't know about you, I'm always looking at that page, like, all the time. Uh, is it going to change? You know, but we're, we're, we're definitely keeping an eye on it. Um, yeah, and there's, you know, I, I do think that we're going to have a different picture by the middle of next year. Can, mm -hmm. Nobody can say for sure, but we're, we're optimistic. Yeah, and if it's not safe, then we won't go, and we'll try again the next year. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can... Um, I can include that on the in the follow-up worldwide quest link to their safety plan that, that that lays out in detail exactly how we how you know when they're going to travel and and what they're going and what what um, um, procedures they'll follow. Um, it's it's all laid out there, and I will send that in the follow-up. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple comments. Anne Kirkland, I think we know her. She oh, said, okay. I think we know her a little bit, yeah. <laughs> at the English Library, the Irish and English, who were otherwise natural enemies, joined forces here since neither could go it alone. Many funny stories, she said. So I, I missed the last, but cut out the last part of it. Say, say it one more time, sorry. So, at the English Library, the Irish and English, who were otherwise natural enemies, joined fo forces here, since neither could go it alone. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, mother. Um, necessity is the mother of um, unwanted compromise, maybe. <laughs> 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 A couple of people are asking, will, be able to, will we be able to watch this again? Yes, Melanie will send out the link to the recording. You can watch it, share it anytime. Um, 
Let's see, Lillian is wondering, what is the name of that first female Canadian novelist? Okay, her pen name is um, Laure Conan. I'll pub put it in the chat. And um, it was, so it was translated by um, Conan, let me put it in the chat here. And the, the, the book is Angelique, de, and I didn't put the accent, sorry. Angelique de Montbrun. And it was translated in, I think, 1994 by, um, translated, Eve, I want to say, Eve, I want to say Brunel. And I can include a link in the follow-up. Great. And it, it's public domain in Canada in the, the French version. So you can also find it, if you want to read it in French, you can buy it. I think it's Edition Boreal publishes it in, in in Canada, and then it's also online. Um, I'll include some links for that. Oh, I spelled misspelled edition. Sorry about that. I'm typing too fast. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Martha's wondering about the type of folktales, songs, and legends of Quebec. Can you suggest sample literature resources? Yeah, I do have some bookmarked here. That is, you know, that is um, not definitely not an area of expertise for me. But in in the course of preparing the seminar, I have put together um, some links and um, especially related to work being done at the UCAM, the University of Quebec at Montreal. So I will be sure to include those in the follow up, and I'll also put them on the trip page itself. Um, I can also use that as a place to gather resources. Fantastic. Yeah, Susan was wondering, can you give them a reading list of the books you just talked about, as well as maybe some books that they could read in advance to part two of this webinar? Absolutely, yes. Nice. Okay, Jane was wondering, was it Pierre Radisson who wrote Chronicles of His Travels in 1600 to 1700? and wondered if that came up in your research. Um, that name does not stick out to me. Um, let me just tough check my notes here. I'm really, I'm the, the 19, or the, sorry, the 20th century is really more my area. I don't, um, I will make a note. Is this, you said Jean's asking or? Jane. Jane, sorry. Um, let me make a note. I uh, yeah, Jane, I'll have to get back to you about that, but I will follow up. I wonder if Jane knows a little something about this Pierre person. Yeah, could you tell us about him in the chat there? And just while she's doing that, I did want to mention th for those of you who are perhaps interested and are, you know, thinking, well, I would like to go, but I'm not sure if I can travel to Canada. Um, or I'm not sure if I can travel. Um, Worldwide Quest through the end of the year is doing a special where um, it's just a $50 deposit. And that's, um, Sam, I believe that's transferable to, to another trip if uh, mm -hmm. necessary. So um, that's, a, that's a way to show us you're interested and, for, and um, for us to keep planning because, you know, once people do travel, or once people do start to travel again, I think there's going to people are as Anne as Anne uh, Kirkland said, people are going to get people will want to bust out. They're going to be ready <laughs> for sure. I know I am. I am going to be so ready. Um, so if you want, if you wanted to put down the deposit again, it's transferable to another trip. So um, you know you don't have to worry about about losing it. That's one way to let us know. Hey, I want to travel. I want to reserve my place on this trip. Yeah, it's only $50. Yeah. Um, Jane if... said that Pierre was an explorer who lived in Quebec at the time. You know, it, it, rings a f it rings a faint bell, but I can't speak to it more than that. But I will follow up, I promise. All right. That looks like it's all the questions. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Sam. And thanks so much, everyone. Um, really appreciate all of you being with us throughout 2020. I think we did, I don't know, did we do like 25 webinars or something like that? At least. <laughs> For sure. Wow. So yeah, it's really, it's been, um, 
I know it's hard because we can never see you, but uh, uh, it's, I really appreciate everybody sticking with us through through this as we, you know, kind of started this, became webinar producers on the side. Um, it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun, and um, I'm looking forward to starting up again uh, with the webinars in 2020. So. We'll, we'll put up the information for the second part of the series as soon as we have it. I'll be working on that a little bit over the Christmas holiday. Um, and, and we'll be sending up the follow-up email. Uh, should I, I will definitely have it out by the end of the week for you. Um, again, feel free to always contact us with any questions. And um, thanks again. This, it's been, uh, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground in the it's past been a wild day. ride <laughs> yeah we've we've yeah it's and so with between nancy and sean and lisa or sorry or wendy and sean and lisa um we have done a lot so thank you so much everyone um and thanks sam for all your help for all this all this time and keeping this going smoothly um i know other presenters and i could could not do it without for help and um it's uh it's really been it, it it's it's been a lot of fun to do this so i'll see you in january with our with the next part of the series and um have a good weekend yep till next time thank yeah, you everybody take care bye thank you